as Matt mentioned, uh, I've had the privilege to work on a number of different media uh, technology projects over the years, everything from building exhibits at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia um, to, to creating dome film experiences um, and data visualization experiences and interactive experiences. And, um, and as Matt mentioned, I also got to work with Ray Kurzweil for about 10 years on a number of different projects. And my job today is that I am now the director of the Emerging Media Lab at the Institute for the Future. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, just a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm the child of two artists. My mom is actually sitting here in the second row. She's an artist. Applause to her. Here's to moms. Um, and I was exposed to art very early in my career, and my father was a photographer, so from the earliest age I was playing with cameras. And from that I've really developed a, a love of light, and that's a theme that goes through all of my work. Uh, another thing that you'll see in my work is collaboration. I really like to work with groups and other folks. And another theme also is uh, mythology. Um, I don't have enough time to go as deep as I'd like to in today, but. The hero's journey is often a, a story framework that I work into a lot of my work. Um, in, in short, kind of this concept of starting in the ordinary world, uh, journeying into a special world to where some sort of power or object is received, and then returning back into the ordinary world. Um, and I think, you know, just one comment on that is I, I've often noticed that I feel like here in the Bay Area, we're really good at taking people through the first two acts, but we often struggle with taking people back home, how do we take them from that magical world and help them bring it into relevance into their normal life? It's much less sexy, um, but very, very important. Um, I'm often asked, what do I actually sell or create? And I would say my, my main product is wonder. <laughs> Not really white bread style, but um, I like to think of wonder as motivated curiosity. So I can always tell that I've, or I always feel that I've been successful when people leave the experiences that I've helped create uh, with a sense that life is a little bit more magical than they thought. So I'm gonna start with first with some of my personal projects before the Institute. I had a, a career of about 20 years as an independent uh, designer and producer and strategist. Uh, and I got to do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, a recent project that I worked on was a project called Evolution of Fire. It was a motion light painting project. It was done in uh, 2015. My collaborator, my main collaborator on that was Eric Freeman, a photographer who's also a musician who goes by the title Elder Flux. Eric and I have a kind of informal club that we call the Epic Journey Club where we go to beautiful places and take very strange camera systems there uh, and play around with them. But at that time we were playing a lot with light painting and specifically uh, using fiber optic brushes to get um, very more organic style light painting. And it was just for fun and we ended up getting invited to the Autumn Lights Festival in Oakland. If you haven't attended, it's a fantastic festival that happens in, in um, August. And we did a bunch of light paintings, just playing around. But then from that, uh, a local uh, startup here called Firefly, they make vaporizers, asked us to do some product shots. So we, had, we started getting a little more serious than that, and those were pr pretty successful. So then we moved on to, uh, they actually asked us to create um, a small campaign for them. So we decided to develop a stop motion project based on this light painting. And that project was called The Evolution of Fire. Here's the result of it. I'm gonna talk over it because there's a lot going on. But basically, what you're about to see is um, stop motion animation. And we used a robotic uh, camera rail system. So it's actually a, perform a photo photographic performance piece because we have eight seconds between each shot to reset. And this was done with six different artists just running around together. Of course, the hardest thing in stop motion animation is only making small changes in between each frame, which is quite difficult when you have to do it in eight seconds. move on from that. Uh, another personal project I want to share is a project called Prototopo, Exploring Topography Through Structured Light. Um, this was also done in 2015. Um, 
It was inspired by my visit to Instant, which is my other favorite art and technology conference uh, that takes place. Well, normally that year it was in, um, in Minneapolis and now it takes place in New Orleans. But if you haven't been or don't know about it, I highly recommend looking into it. Uh, really inspiring, so similar to this, getting to meet a lot of artists. But I was particularly taken by the artists that didn't just show the, their end products, but showed all the prototyping that they did. Uh, and it really got me inspired to do more prototyping. I was also really excited that year because uh, the Sony MP-CL1 came out. This is one of the first uh, laser projector systems. It was a Pico projector. It's about the size of a cigarette pack. Uh, but what's special about it is actually it's, it's a laser projector uh, inside of that. It's an RGB scanning laser, and it actually works very similar to a CRT in that it's being drawn as a raster scan by the li uh, laser line going horizontally. Uh, and what's really special about that, especially uh, for projection mapping, is that because there's no lens involved, um, basically you have infinite focus. So for wrapping around contours, you don't have to worry about any focus issues. It's also very small and portable and was great for, for tabletop style, size uh, proto uh, prototyping. It's very inspired by some of these other projection mapping artists here. Um, and at the time, I was also working a lot with structured light camera systems for my day jobs. Uh, so something like a Kinect. And um, I was really taken by the, actually the aesthetics of the structured light itself. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with structured light, basically, uh, if you can look on the right here, you, you basically project a known pattern onto a contoured surface. And then you're able to, through, by seeing the distortion in that known pattern, that structured light, you're able to figure out the depth and the topography, uh, which allows you to, to get 3D imagery. Um, something like this. And our eyes work in a similar way. If you look at my arm here, you can see the contouring here. You know that it should be a flat light and you interpret that as depth. So I wanted to play with this idea of exploring uh, contour and topography through structured light patterns. So this is one of the first experiments I did just with some fabric with uh, one of my uh, uh, longtime collaborators and my, my life partner as well, Liza Bender. And we were just playing with some uh, fabric here, but it's just early tests to see how effective it was, and we're really excited. It worked out really well. You can see it's creating really complex contours, and your eye very quickly is trying to make sense of that. This is another early test that we did. The size of the projector it made, allowed us to work very, in very small uh, a scale, and you didn't have to worry about focal distances. Then we, started, then we uh, moved on to doing an installation, a light art installation where you could actually uh, go inside of the fabric and dance around. And then I uh, started collaborating with a number of different Bay Area artists, uh, some of whom are in the audience today, um, but just an excuse to hang out and play with light with folks. This was a collaboration with some other photographers and filmmakers. We were actually using two projectors for this shoot. This was a special opportunity uh, monument. Another artist collective here had a surrealist potluck. So we brought the projector and a, and a mist maker and it created kind of volumetric light. And we offered a light meal for anybody that wanted to have a snack. This is a movement artist, uh, Andrea, uh, Andrea Illusion. This is with a fashion photographer and model and stylist. Scott Kildall, who's here in the third row, also an amazing artist who's shown here. This was some of his work that we started integrating in. So now we're adding movement to the structured light, so adding even more layers. And this was with a commercial photographer, um, Nicolas, uh, um, who lives in the East Bay. and uh, an amazing designer and painter friend of ours in Vallejo, Vibrata. And this is <laughs> some work with our, a mad scientist friend of ours, Brian Pinkham, who lives in Berkeley. Uh, we started getting into some really trippy stuff here, projecting faces on faces and bodies on bodies. Professor Pinkham, how do you know which way is up and which way is down? I'm not quite sure anymore. It's quite disorienting. <laughs> anyway, you can see we had a lot of fun. Uh, this was our last collaboration. We decided to, to cap it at 12. This was with, actually, this was one of the artists that had inspired us to work on this, Leslie Benson, who lives in um, Santa Cruz. She's an incredible paper artist. Uh, she creates all these pieces that she makes out of a single sheet of paper folded and cut. Uh, and she's also a fashion designer. So we did a, a, a shoot with her. 
Um, and it was kind of our, our, our final graduation uh, shoot. Here, we shot a bunch of video too. It's a little bit compressed, but you can get a sense of how it moves. And then with my VJ roots, I started taking some of that footage just to remix and make some fun uh, VJ clips as well. So that's uh, basically a quick overview of a couple of my past personal projects. My largest project now, as Matt mentioned, is, I, uh, is now uh, the biggest project I've ever done, uh, working at the Emerging Media Lab and actually forming the Emerging Media Lab um, at the Institute for the Future. Um, the Institute for the Future is a real place. <laughs> you can go and visit. It's in Palo Alto, California. Um, and uh, if you go into the basement, that's where the Emerging Media Lab is. Uh, the Institute was founded in 1968, so it's the largest, the longest running futurist organization, I believe, in the world. Um, and it's an incredible group of uh, researchers and um, futurists. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm a futurist yet. I'm gonna borrow from my friend Tony, who says I'm future curious, which I like. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so um, last year, just around this time, uh, we started the beginnings of which, what has become the Emerging Media Lab, the emergence of the Emerging Media Lab. At, at the lab, uh, we do kind of th three areas of focus. Uh, we, we're tracking proliferation of, of media technologies. Oh, and I forgot to mention on an earlier slide, but really what we're focusing on is experiential communication platforms. So right now, that really means a lot of virtual reality, mixed reality, and augmented reality technologies. But specifically in the, in the service of com human communication. So we're tracking proliferation of these technologies, like you know what's new, what's available. Um, we're hacking applications, we're seeing what they're supposed to be good for, and then we're kind of coming up with new uses for these things. Um, and then unpacking implications is kind of the larger uh, mission of the Institute. So what does this mean? Um, and that's where my collaboration with the rest of the researchers at the Institute really um, comes into effect. And the work that we're doing there is you know, basically R&D, we're doing a lot of prototyping projects, we're doing some custom client projects, as well as um, serving as a, basically an experiential communication uh, arm for the institute, for the other research groups. So not just studying virtual reality, but actually using virtual reality technologies to communicate speculative design uh, concepts from the, other, from the other research groups. So I'm gonna share a couple projects that we've worked on just in this first year. The first project is a project called Emergence. It's a virtual reality music composition and performance. Um, this was done last summer. Um, it was part of an uh, event that has now become a series at the Institute called Reality Mixers, where I, where I bring in artists and performers who are using virtual reality or other emerging technologies in their performances, um, and uh, super fun. <laughs> um, but this performance was actually um, combination of four elements. Uh, we, I put together a performance system based on an Oculus DK2. Uh, we attached a leap motion hand tracker to the front of the headset and then we uh, worked with some software specifically written for that hardware con configuration called Lyra VR. Um, it was re really alpha software, so it was, had a lot of rough edges, but we're, some, sometimes you find that uh, working with constraints and issues actually brings out some new types of creativity. And then, of course, the fourth component to the system was the human performer, and I um, brought in a f dear friend of mine who I've done a number of projects with over the years, Daniel Berkman, who's an amazing composer and multi-instrumentalist, and um, he works with everything from Baroque um, instruments like the viola da gamba all the way up to looping and whatnot. But he had never done a virtual reality, uh, he'd never even done any virtual reality uh, before, so this was his first experience. And that's something that we like to do at the Institute. One of the things we say is that artists are natural futurists. Um, a lot of our clients are, you know, they're basically like Fortune 100 companies and very large not, uh, governmental organizations. And, you know, big organizations tend to think uh, about measurement. How do we measure what we've done, what has happened, and how do we project out, you know, what we're going to do and scale that out? But of course, um, the future cannot be measured. And um, especially in increasingly disruptive times, it's really hard to anticipate the future based on what's happened in the past. So that's where imagination and the, um, uh, the role of the artist really comes into play. So uh, the performance, which I'm gonna play a little clip from, is basically, it's a seven minute performance, and I do it as kind of an edu edutainment experience for our, our research clients. Uh, it's fun, it's interesting, it's engaging. It also helps them understand that these VR right now, a lot of people look at it and say, oh, it's a, t it's a toy, it's a game, it's a 
kind of movie that wraps around my head and really what we're trying to introduce is this concept that this is a new form of interface and it's really, these are new computing platforms. To, so to see human expressing themselves artistically and creatively in that, it really helps to, to uh, make that point for them. So I'm gonna play a clip from that now. It's just a short clip. If you wanna see the whole thing, it's on, Vimeo, on my Vimeo site. If you go to my website, toshihu.com, you can see the whole thing. The next project that I uh, worked on at the Institute was a, a project called Labyrinth. It's a mixed reality delivery portal. <laughs> um, basically what that was, was one of the other, uh, one of the largest research groups at the Institute is called te uh, Tech Horizons. Uh, we're not, uh, not all the research groups are technology based. We have a future of food, future of health, future of governance. This happened to be one of the technology focused research groups. Um, and uh, their theme that year was when everything is media. So it was actually a perfect time to integrate in the Emerging Media Lab. This is uh, their annual research report. It's really more of a um, uh, graphic novel, <laughs> kind of boring research report. It's, it's a pretty amazing uh, publication. Um, and they wanted to, they asked me, is there a way that we could present this to our clients? It's a printed book, essentially, uh, in a way that um, would be something unique and memorable. So we thought about it, and especially since they're really, they were talking and thinking a lot about ambient and immersive communications, we decided to create a virtual reality, uh, well, it's really a mixed reality experience. Uh, and for that, I brought in my, uh, my girlfriend and longtime collaborator, Liza, who's, um, who's also not a technology-based artist. She's a designer, environmental designer, and a painter, and a collage artist. Um, and I basically had her, um, uh, we, we set up a tilt brush setup in the lab and we make, made an extra large capture zone. So if you're not familiar with tilt brush, it's a 3D painting program. Uh, and we set up, typically a, a, a Vive setup, a capture zone is about 12 foot by 12 foot. But we added some extra cables and we extended it out to about 20 feet by 20 feet to make an area that someone could, could walk around. And we created a labyrinth, a spiral labyrinth, um, that basically people were able to enter into uh, and walk around in a spiral in virtual reality in, in a hand-painted scene and then enter into an inner chamber where they would actually see a virtual copy of uh, Future Now uh, floating in front of them, and then we were, they, they didn't have any headphones on, they could hear you in the room, so we encouraged them to reach forward and grab, and actually, we had pl you'll see in the video, we had placed a, a real um, copy, and that's how you would received your, um, your research report. So this is an overview of the whole model. For most of our clients, this was their first virtual reality experience ever. <laughs> so, we had some cables on the floor, and so we placed some, some flames on the ground that people had to step over. Some people were more coordinated than others. <laughs> but that was the mixed reality element. Basically, mixed reality is when you combine physical reality with virtual reality. We even had a fan, you can see there, blowing up on them to kind of simulate the particle effects that were coming at you. <laughs> One of the best things about my job is putting people through virtual reality, specifically tilt brush for, for the first time and just seeing them take the headset off and just seeing that like childlike joy, that sense of wonder, that, it's just amazing. Oh, thanks. And Liza is here in the audience filming over there. 
A um, couple more projects. I'm very excited to share this project. We just launched it literally two days ago here at our largest research conference of the year, which is our 10-year forecast gathering. It's about 200 people gathering together. Uh, we have, it's a, uh, and uh, every year we pick a different theme for, for our 10-year forecast. Uh, this year the theme was geographies of transition. In the next 10 years, how are the maps of our world going to transform and how do you continue to navigate as those maps reconfigure and dissolve? So one of the themes that kind of came, came out of this year was this idea of designing for impermanence, just assuming that things are going to be changing. Uh, and and um, so we decided to hold the conference this year on the USS Hornet, which is in Alameda. It's a decommissioned aircraft carrier which now is an aerospace museum, so it's full of crazy cool airplanes, helicopters, and spaceships. Um, really great spot for us. Um, and uh, when we got to, we did a site visit, we discovered that the way you get your equipment and onto the ship is through this crazy crane that lifts shipping containers onto the deck. And the director of the program, Dylan Hendricks, a good friend of mine, said, you know, isn't a shipping container about the size of a virtual reality capture zone? Could we put a VR system inside a shipping container? And it just, things grew from there. Um, and we basically realized, we, we did some testing, it's actually just about the right size. And that's when Simtainer was born. Um, so uh, the concept here, again, was, you know, we're think, looking at kind of designing for impermanence and reconfigurable architecture. Um, and it was ap also happened to be taking place right next to the port of Oakland where containerization kind of exploded in the same year our institute was, was created in 1968. So there's all these threads that were, that were gathered through. So uh, with the director and one of my research managers who, who knows Unity, we created Simtainer, which was a virtual reality experience inside of a shipping container. This is a panorama of the experience. Oh, you can see Matt Ganeshow right there. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and uh, yeah, we weren't sure how it was gonna work out. We didn't really get to test it in a real container until the, the day before, and it, it was a huge success. We see this as a platform that we're gonna continue developing uh, for. And uh, I'll talk you through the experience as the video plays. Let's see here. So we're we were looking at three forms of reuses of shipping containers. When you first go on the experience, you're actually inside another shipping container <laughs> in virtual reality. Uh, but uh, from there, you would go into a micro clinic, and we partnered with organizations that are actually building out these projects for the designs and to um, advise us on the projects. The second location was a micro home. You can actually see at the end of the, the clinic, you, you're told to sit on a stool, and then you end up sitting on the toilet in the house, <laughs> which is kind of a funny a mixed reality transition moment. Um, in our research around micro uh, homes, one of the interesting things we realized is that there's really two categories of micro housing. One is, um, uh, is for disaster relief and refugee housing, and the other category is uh, really luxury retreat homes. So, and they're not that different in their design. It really just depends on where they're, they're placed. Are you in the middle of a refugee camp or are you, um, you know, up in Tahoe <laughs> in front of a lake? The last uh, location was a micro farm, which is based on existing designs that are happening now. Oh, here's Matt Ganeshaw testing it out. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, I had to put you in there. <laughs> I don't know if he knew I did, that I was cheating. Oh, and of course, we added the googly eyes, which humanizes it a little bit. Anyway, so that's the Simtainer, and we're excited to continue building this out and uh, scaling it out and creating more experiences there. Um, a couple really quick more projects. Body Worlds AR is a, is a um, uh, private project we're doing for the Tech Museum. If you're, if, if you're not familiar with Body Worlds, it's an incredible uh, traveling exhibit that's basically plastinated human bodies um, created by this guy, crazy German, Gunther von Hagen, figured out how to plastinate human tissue, essentially. Um, so we're working with the Tech Museum who's about to host it um, starting in October to create an augmented reality exhibit that wraps around the physical exhibit. And we're doing that using the um, um, Tango phones that are coming out. This is called the Fab 2 Pro, so it's gonna be a handheld augmented reality exhibit. Um, and that'll be launching in October. And I'm super excited because actually in order to create that, we're creating a whole AR authoring platform called Artifactor that's gonna allow us to basically um, place augmented reality exhibits anywhere. Part of what we've realized through w working with the museum is that essentially a museum is like a collection of stuff with like annotation or additional information and through augmented reality, the whole world can become a museum. And so we're looking excited to create that out with my lead developer. 
And then the last project is we're about to embark on a trip to China, and uh, this is an ethnographic study of VR street culture. There's a whole bunch of, because of limited space in homes in China, most of virtual reality is actually happening in public uh, arcades and malls and whatnot, so we're gonna be do doing a little film study of that. Anyway, that's my talk, and uh, very excited to be here, and thank you for listening.